Thank you all so much for coming. We're really excited about today's talk. Uh, CS50, as you may know, has been experimenting in the world of virtual reality, or VR, over the past year. And we've had our eye on augmented reality, or AR, which you might know in some form from like Pokemon Go, if like a year ago you were playing that quite a bit. Um, our friend Abhishek here, though, from NYU, who recently finished up there, has been working as a resident researcher, truly took things to the next level. Uh, he went viral recently, as you may have seen, with his implementation of Super Mario Brothers in augmented reality. And while perhaps a bit socially awkward, it's been quite a bit of time walking down a path uh, in Central Park, creating this amazing world that he's kindly offered to share with us today. So Abhishek Singh. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Abhishek. And let me just kick these things off. I mean, David's already done an intro introduction, but let me just um, go over it ag again. Uh, so I graduated last year from um, NYU IDP. And ITP is the Interactive Telecommunications Program um, at NYU. It's kind of like a mix of a design and tech and art kind of program. And that's where I kind of uh, started doing a bunch of crazy, odd, slightly off kind of projects. Uh, one of them was uh, this shoe. And this shoe is something that you can wear. And you can uh, control and customize completely f uh, from your phone. Another thing that I did was um, an interactive installation in Times Square. Uh, so this went up on a 40-foot billboard uh, in Times Square. You could text in what outraged you on the internet that day. Um, I also built this 20-foot dragon uh, that you could sit on and ride. And that w I, by, by riding it, you were controlling a dragon, a virtual recreation of this dragon in a, in a virtual world as well. And uh, following that, I also made this little desktop assistant. Um, and this is a desktop assistant that responds to your voice, but he responds entirely through GIFs. Um, um, and this actually was the project that went viral uh, prior to this current project. Uh, and yet here I am today uh, talking to you guys about AR. So how exactly did that happen? Well, David already re revealed that. But um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. Like, this might have been created prior to most of us being born, but at the same time, we all recognize it, and we all kind of grew up and played it at least once, right? Um, and this is Super Mario Brothers, and what I did was I recreated this, except I recreated it um, in AR as a life-size uh, first-person game. So I took the iconic first level of Super Mario Brothers and rebuilt it uh, for the HoloLens. And that's what I'm here to kind of talk to you about today. Um, in addition to my experiences of building this game, I also want to just talk to you about augmented reality in general, and also some of the tools, at least a cursory look at some of the tools that are available to us to start building um, stuff in AR. So um, AR is essentially taking virtu virtual objects and placing them into the real world. But I uh, say not just placing them into the real world, but also placing them uh, with them having a knowledge of what the world around them is, knowledge of surfaces, and maybe being able to even interact with them. Uh, and to be honest, AR is quite pervasive already, right? Um, we all know about Snapchat filters, and we use them like on a re regular basis. And this is AR to some extent. It's augmenting our reality. And Snapchat is pushing this further now. So they have taken that, and they pushed it to what they're calling world lenses, in which their stickers or these 3D objects are actually aware of where they are placed positionally in the world. And Apple recently made a huge announcement, um, and they released AR Kit, like opening up, um, hopefully, to what will lead much larger adoption amongst consumers. Um, and all this uh, comes under, under a subcategory or a subset of AR, which is called Markerless AR. So Markerless AR is essentially what is based on a technology called SLAM. And SLAM is simultaneous location and mapping. So what it's doing in this is using the device's camera, but it's using the device's camera to essentially figure out unique spots, surfaces, and planes within the environment. Once it figures that out in real time, it can then move around, pan around the objects, and keep them fixed, fixed and anchored to their actual location. Compare Markerless to the other thing, which is marker-based AR. And it's not QR codes, but it's kind of QR codes on steroids. And QR codes on steroids is something which is being uh, used by this company, Vuforia. And it uses similar except it's less computationally intensive and it's a less of a techn technological challenge. What it does is it takes a unique image that you can upload. So you can upload any unique image. And it uses figures out points within that image. And using the distances and the positions between that points, it can find out the angle of, um, the, angle of the image and accordingly figure out how it needs to orient your hologram or your virtual object on top of that image. So that's marker-based image. 
Now, um, David mentioned this uh, earlier, Pokemon Go. I haven't mentioned it yet. And the reason I haven't mentioned it yet is because when Pokemon Go released their teaser video, this is what they showed, right? This looks like AR. Like the objects are there, they're in the scene, they're interacting with it. But when the app actually launched, this is what you got, <laughs> right? And um, this to me is not true AR. The reason it's not true AR is because the holograms or the virtual objects have no idea and they have of, of the environment around them. They have no idea of surfaces, they don't have no idea of objects, and they can, cannot interact with it in any way. It's simply just a screen with a sticker overlaid onto it. Right? Uh, but all of these they still come under the category of what is a mobile AR, what Apple, uh, Facebook, and now uh, and obviously Snapchat for some time have been pushing. If you compare, and mobile AR is essentially your mobile headset or your mobile handset is a window into the world. So you point your handset at either a surface or at a particular marker, and you see a hologram in its place. On the other hand, um, as compared to mobile, you have these headsets. And Microsoft is obviously pushing a, a lot in this, and it's probably got the most sophisticated headset out there right now, which is called the HoloLens. And it, they call it holographic computing. It's a headset that you wear on your head. Um, and you can see objects overlaid in the environment. Uh, it has, since it's a completely new form of computing, it has completely different interactions. We're all used to mobile interactions, swipe, tap, all those things. But for the HoloLens, it uses these four forms. It uses gaze, which is essentially where you're looking. Uh, it uses gestures, and these are specific gestures that I'll just cover uh, shortly. It uses voice, uh, similar to Siri. Um, and it also has a clicker that comes along with it, which can double up as a mouse um, and interact with objects that you're looking at. So the two gestures that the HoloLens supports um, is the air tap. The air tab is you make a tap, and you just kind of tap in front of it. And this is similar to what a mouse click would do. And the other one is the bloom. And the bloom gesture is just like a, the home button on your iPhone. Whatever, wherever you are, it will take you back to the home screen. But what the HoloLens does really well is spatial mapping. So it has a bunch of cameras, four cameras to be precise, and a depth sensor, which is similar to what the Microsoft had in the Kinect which you can then look around in your environment to map it out. Um, and so it knows where surfaces exist, where objects is, exist, so that you can actually place your holograms on those surfaces or have them interact with those surfaces in real time. The only issue, uh, I mean, one of the several issues, and this is obviously a very early, um, I would say, prototype or development kit of a headset, is that it has an extremely narrow field of view. So it's not as immersive as if you have tried virtual reality, it's not as immersive as that. But it's definitely a big step towards having these headsets. And for me, headsets is definitely something which is not probably going to happen in the next couple of years, but maybe five or seven years from now, just because it keeps your hands completely free. So mobile is a good first st uh, stepping stone into AR. Uh, let me begin by how I got to making Mario. And it actually all started with this one simple cube up here. So um, now you m must be wondering how it started with this cube, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. So uh, it, when I got an access to, um, to a HoloLens, and that's the great thing about universities, is you get access to technology and equipment that otherwise you possibly couldn't afford. Um, I, I already knew that what I wanted to create was a large, expansive outdoor experience. The HoloLens and the Microsoft uh, FAQs, they specifically say it's meant for indoor use. And it is not uh, meant to be used outdoor, and it's meant to be used in s kind of small quarters. But I always saw the opportunity of AR to be something that you can use outdoors, something that you can move through, something which may have a fitness uh, element to it, something that, um, that would actually sh take technology out from within the rooms um, and into the real world. So I decided that I'm going to create some sort of street runner game, right? I would create a game that would exist in the streets of New York, and I would run through it, uh, completing it, and probably possibly record it just for my own fun. While I was learning HoloLens development, and everything starts with like either a bouncing ball, or you have like a cube that you place, and there's the basics, the absolute basics, I took this white cube, and I kind of moved it around in the space. I moved it around in 3D space in the HoloLens, except during one of those tests, I placed it slightly above my head. And for some unknown reason, I stepped under it, and I jumped. And then as soon as I jumped, uh, all the memories from my childhood came rushing back. And I was like, 
this is Super Mario, and this is this white cube is the brick that I'm supposed to uh, that I'm supposed to like hit with my head and have a mushroom come out of. Uh, so uh, so starting with that, I was like, Super Mario solves everything that I was going for. I wanted to create a large experience. I wanted it to be outdoor, and it added the other uh, additional thing that it now had a purpose. Like what my game was lacking, I did not know what the purpose of my game was. But Super Mario had a purpose. You, the player is moving through it to reach the end, to complete the level. And in, in addition to that, it has this huge legacy behind it, right? Uh, everybody, it's immediately relatable, and I knew that it had viral potential. So um, the first step was a ton of research. And a ton of research meant watching the video on loop over and over again till I practically memorized every single interaction and every single element on that. It also meant going back and playing the game, something which I hadn't done in, uh, in several years, to actually get um, a sense of all the game mechanics. After I had done that, um, I was the next step was recreating in 3D. And the first step to recreate it in 3D was to get a handle of the assets. I was. Uh, I thought this would be pretty simple. Super Mario's been there for 30 years. People have definitely created 3D assets that I could easily download for free online um, and include them into my game. But that wasn't the case. It wasn't the aesthetic that I matched, and it was priced at a ridiculous $5. It's now at a discount. Um, <laughs> so uh, it made more sense to instead spend one week building it myself. Um, well, it, at least it made, it, made, it made more sense at the time. In retrospect, probably five dollars would have saved me a lot of time. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, I, I decided um, that I'm going to um, design all the elements myself. So I picked Autodesk Fusion 360, which is like a CAD uh, program, and I, I started designing these elements. The only problem was that I have only been used to seeing the elements in this way. I don't know how they look in 3D. I don't even know what the underside of this brick looks like. So I had to reimagine and rethink all these elements and how they would grow in 3D. So it turns out I decided that this is how the, the brick would look instead. And this is how the underside of the brick would look. And then going back, I found 2D cutouts of all the elements and then recreated them in 3D. So this is the Goomba, which for the longest time I used to call bad mushroom. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is the Koopa Troopa, which I obviously always call bad turtle. Um, uh, so once I had all the assets um, uh, built out, the next step was bringing it into the game engine of my choice. And the game engine of my choice is Unity, not only because of my familiarity with it, but also because it's the one that supports HoloLens development and has an SDK which allows you to build and deploy to the HoloLens. So just a quick segue into Unity for those who are not um, used to it. Um, or not familiar with it, Unity is essentially a game development en engine which has democ democratized the creation of 2D and 3D games for developers everywhere. Uh, so it's pretty simple when you think of it. You create an object and you attach a script to it. And that script allows you to give that object a behavior, uh, add interactions, or add a animations of any sort. And you can script it in a, a multiple languages, C Sharp, JavaScript, Unity. The reason I've listed them in this order is because this is the popularity uh, of the community. Everybody kind of prefers C Sharp. And you'll also find many more links and many more um, help tutorials on that. So uh, once I br brought it into uh, Unity, the next step was painstakingly recreating the entire stage. right? Entire stage, but not only the entire stage, but each and every single game mechanic. And now when I think of it and when I look back, I'm like truly amazed of how these programmers were able to do this in like 1985 when there was no Google, there was no Stack Overflow, and you had to basically figure all these things out yourself. Um, so um, building the level took some time. And at the end of it, I was able to cre recreate this entire level. So what you're seeing here is the Unity interface, and you can see the level within it, um, but it's not in 2D. As you see, I, I kind of scroll around. All these elements were then recreated in, th uh, in 3D. And I, I built this to scale. So I built this to human scale. So the final length of the entire level was about 110 meters long, which means I needed a space which was at least 110 meters long to be able to play it myself. Um, there were obviously several challenges along the way, um, and what I like to call several hacks or programmatic illusions that I had to undertake to actually bring Mario to life. Because Mario, after all, is a video game, right? So he can defy the laws of physics, which are not necessarily possible for me yet. Um, so, so, so one of the things was 
he can jump twice his height. <laughs> I, I can't do that. And at the same time, uh, he can collide with bricks. And I can't collide with holograms. Uh, so how do I kind of work my way around that? Uh, so so do th uh, to do that, just uh, to kind of get an understanding, is that the HoloLens knows its position in space. So the HoloLens is placed on my head. It kind of knows where it is lo located in space. So I attached a collider to the HoloLens, starting from my head and moving down to what my height is. And I, I attached a collider to every brick, 3D brick in the scene. Except the bricks had to be much higher uh, to give the same effect. So I just offset the collider from the bricks. So brought the collider down. The colliders are invisible. They're not uh, visible to anybody. But by jumping just a few inches off the ground, I could still collide with them and have the same interaction. Right? So now you can see bricks are much higher than I could possibly reach. But I'm still able to jump and interact with them and get the coin out of it. The next thing was spontaneously growing when you eat a mushroom. So yes, I can't spontaneously grow either. Uh, so how, how did I achieve that? Instead of me growing, I decided that everything around me would shrink. So um, that would give at least the illusion that I had now grown. Um, the other thing that you see um, in, in Mario is there are several visual cues, visual, visual uh, cues interspersed throughout the game. As soon as he gets a power up, his costume changes, um, and he has this kind of blinking effect. So I couldn't figure out how to do the costume change, uh, but I did figure out how to do the blinking effect. So I, uh, as soon as you hit the, uh, the power up, you see kind of this overlay which mimics the blinking effect, so you know you've got the thing. But um, stripping and in immediately changing in the middle of Central Park was a little bit off limits. <laughs> Um, and, and finally, the other thing is that how do I interact with something that doesn't really exist? Right? The holograms have no physical, uh, I mean, they, they have nothing. There is no material. They're just completely uh, creations of light. Um, and he's supposed to jump around, uh, jump on these holograms, jump on these pipes. So I found a really fi a simple fix to this. I was working in 3D, so I decided to just walk around them. Uh, <laughs> Um, and then uh, moving on, like these were just what I like to call programmatic illusions. But in addition to that, there were also a bunch of hacks and a bunch of hacks um, with the, uh, to tweak the HoloLens to work over such a large expanse. The HoloLens is meant for indoor use. It's meant to be used within small quarters. It's not meant to be used outdoors on a flat surface which has very little differentiation on it. Like a road five meters from here looks exactly the same as the road five meters behind. So it's very difficult for the HoloLens to figure out what uh, it saw or what it's going to see. Um, and at the same time, it was outdoors, and it's over 110 meter expanse. Uh, so to, to achieve that, um, I had to do a number of hacks. But the first thing before reaching any of that, I realized was that what if someone else wants to play this game? What if someone else who is not as tall as me or who is much taller than me wants to play this game? everything would be lower for them or higher for them, and they would not be able to complete it. So the first step what I did was I integrated this calibrator of sorts. As soon as you start the game, you first enter your height in centimeters. And once you enter your height in centimeters, it calibrates the level to your particular height. So if you are really short, the bricks will be closer to you. And if you are really tall, the bricks will be further above. So irrespective of whatever your physical build is, you will be able to complete the entire level. Um, after that, I went about like scouting a location. And in scouting the location, I, I did make a mistake. I spent too much time developing indoors in my computer rather than going and testing outdoors in the actual location that I was going to shoot. So I picked Central Park. And I picked Central Park. This area is called the Mall in Central Park. And it's the only straight stretch of land um, in Central Park. And probably in New York, which is so empty that I could actually go and uh, play this without being run over by a car or arrested by someone. Uh, so um, so I, I picked this place. And as soon as I went to the place, and the first thing I, I realized was that the holograms were much more transparent than when I was filming them indoors. And that's the reason why Microsoft also recommends that you film, uh, that, that you use the, the holograms and use the HoloLens indoors. The reason is that indoors, you can control the lighting. The lighting is more consistent. It's not as harsh as sunlight. Uh, so the holograms, which are based essentially on playing with light, are much more opaque. To get around that, I, I again found a programmatic hack. Instead of um, capturing 
the video directly through the, ho the through the HoloLens. I did capture the video directly through the HoloLens, but instead of capturing through the HoloLens hardware itself, I captured it from within my app running on the HoloLens. So I wrote a custom script that would allow me to increase the opacity of the uh, holograms as they were being captured. So th while this is the exact view, and the reason why I have added these translucent um, Q, uh, this translucent squares on the edges is that this is the actual field of view of the HoloLens, what you're seeing. And, and the rest of it is what is captured by the HoloLens cameras, but it's not what is visible from within the headset. Uh, so I figured out how to get the holograms to be completely opaque, which was extremely uh, necessary for me at least, just to show the potential of AR and just to get the point across. Because it, it was much more uh, Im uh, compelling seeing it this way than seeing a translucent washed out hologram instead. But every action has some kind of reaction and the result of this was that the hologram, uh, the HoloLens sees everything that is black as transparent. So, so that's how um, everything that gets bl is black gets overlaid with the real world. So I had created these pits, right? The pits that you remember in the stage that if you fall into, you kind of die. I had created these pits and I created the exterior to be completely black so that they would be completely transparent to the HoloLens. But as a result of ri writing my own uh, custom script to capture this, the holograms were now being rendered in my final capture as completely black. So even though in the HoloLens while I was walking around, everything looked fine. In the final video capture, it was looking like one gigantic black cube embedded into the floor. Uh, so to find a way around this, I tried two things. Um, both were writing custom shaders. So a shader is essentially like a program which gives you on a pixel or vertex level control. So you can define how every pixel is rendered uh, on, onto the screen. So the first thing that I did was I wrote a, a custom shader that essentially what it did was it made the black transparent to the camera, but opaque to everything behind it. So as a result of that, I could not see anything unless I stepped right over it. But the problem with this was that it was extremely uh, computationally intensive. And as a result of that, the final capture was extremely jittery, and there was too much drift and lag while I was moving through the stage. So instead of that, I used something called a stencil buffer. And a stencil buffer is, some, uh, is what you can consider to be a mask. So everything that you see through that mask is visible. And if you don't look through that mask, it's not visible. Um, and the resulting effect is something like this. So you can walk up to the pit, and you can look down, and it looks completely overlaid onto uh, the floor. And the stencil mask, or the stencil buffer, is low, overlaid right on top of it. So it's like a window into this object, but it's only when I look through this window that I can see anything that's uh, inside it. All that was fine, but as a result of not testing outdoors enough, uh, the, the other issue that ar arose was that there was a lot of drift. And what I mean by a lot of drift was the entire level, as I moved further into it, was shifting tremendously to the left or the right or up or down. And you can kind of think of that as a pivot, right? If you, if you look at my elbow, and if you think of my elbow as a pivot, as I move my hand, everything that's further away moves, moves more than everything that's closer to the pivot. And the result of, uh, and the issue was that I had one single pivot. I had one single pivot <coughs> where the stage was initialized. So any movement, any recalculation that the, ho uh, that the HoloLens did to figure out where it was positioned in space, shifted e everything further into the stage by a factor of five. Uh, so to get around that, I had to do the biggest code rewrite ever. Practically go back to scratch and split the stage that I'd now coded as one gigantic stage into small sections, into small chunks. So I took the entire thing and split it into 23 sections, right? And each section had a spatial anchor. And a spatial anchor is something that the HoloLens can use to anchor a hologram in space. So each of these cubes that you see on the screen over here um, wa was used as visual cues by me to signify the start and end of a section. And there was an anchor, which is obviously invisible, completely based in the center of each section. And by placing the first anchor, so I would just place the first anchor on the floor and then place every subsequent anchor completely perfectly aligned to it following that. So at the end of it, it each uh, even though the entire stage was working as one cohesive whole, it was actually made up of 23 different parts, each part being anchored completely uh, independent of each other. 
And that helped get rid of the drift completely and also helped it stay level on the floor. Once all these kind of issues were uh, sorted out and th there were a bunch of other things which if I get into, we'll probably be sitting here all day. Um, um, I decided that it was time, right? It was time to finally film this and put it out there. But before doing that, I obviously had to dress up as Mario. <laughs> because the entire, entire uh, point of this was that it's a first person game in which you step into the sh shoes of Mario. So you are Mario. So I had to be Mario. So um, again, it was kind of a, a do-it-yourself kind of outfit. I purchased the uh, overalls from Amazon. I had a full sleeve. Uh, overalls and the gloves were from Amazon. I built the buttons, the yellow buttons out of wood, uh, just kind of taped them to myself. And I uh, luckily had a full sleeve red t-shirt. Um, uh, so after that, uh, I went ahead to Central Park. Went early in the morning because um, one, it's less crowded, right? I would get fewer, well, weirded out looks. Um, and at the, same, uh, at the same time, the light was uh, less harsh. So as the sunlight gets uh, harsher and harsher, uh, it's worse for the holograms to affect itself. So uh, let's just have a look, because it was not just about the holograms looking perfectly, it was also about the audio working perfectly. Uh, a lot of the things, like I cannot physically feel a hologram. So I had to rely a lot on audio cues to know that I had performed the correct task or the correct event had kind of occurred. So Mario obviously has ev each and every um, asset file of the audio available online. So I just used those and triggered them at perfectly the perfectly timed events. But it was not just about uh, what we are used to seeing in Mario, right? The other thing is like what we're not used to seeing in Mario. And one of the things that I always wondered was what was inside the castle at the end. But now that I was building it myself, I was like, okay, now we can actually see what's inside this castle at the end. Um, and since it's like a 3D castle, you actually get to walk into it and look up. Uh, so at the end of the stage, once you uh, clear the level, unfortunately I couldn't slide down that flag, um, you simply step into the castle. And the castle is a life size, it completely occludes everything around it, and you can see that not only does it uh, set up the flag, but you can look out through the windows, you can look out through the roof, and you can look out through the door. Um, so I kind of had this headline in my head uh, when I was like, okay, this has kind of viral potential, um, the end effect looks really good, and probably someone is going to post this saying like, a uh, crazy dude in Mario costume seen running through Central Park early in the morning. <laughs> um, but, um, but I kind of underestimated New York. I did get a headline, but it was no one thought it was real. Uh, um, but, but I beg to differ because I was able to then zoom in on someone, and I did get a bunch of looks. Uh, so uh, there were de definitely a lot of confused looks, but then again, it's New York, so people have definitely seen things weirder than uh, <laughs> me jumping around early in the morning in uh, Central Park. Um, and it led to a lot of interesting conversations. It lot, uh, led to a lot of people just kind of taking pictures, figuring out what exactly was happening, because most people had not seen a HoloLens before, and most people were not familiar with augmented reality or virtual reality. So there was a lot of, um, I guess, interest by seeing what I was doing there early in the morning. Um, once I shot this, and I shot this on a Tuesday, I posted it out on Wednesday by starting uh, to post it on Reddit. Um, and that's when it kind of went viral. So it didn't go viral immediately. Wednesday, I posted on Reddit. It got deleted for some uh, reason. Well, <laughs> I didn't delete it, but apparently I was violating some rule. So uh, it got, and I, I thought it's kind of over. I said, I'll try again next week. But somehow it got picked up by a couple of uh, sites, um, and I tweeted out to HoloLens. I tweeted out to HoloLens saying, hey, check out what I built. Um, never heard anything back from them, um, and went, went to sleep. Um, I woke up next morning, and the video had completely skyrocketed. Um, the tweet was now at like 5,000 uh, retweets, and everybody across the internet was somehow talking about this thing. Right? Uh, I woke up to 30 emails all asking for permission to use this. And by the end of it, it was covered in almost all major publications uh, across the internet. And from, it was not only about recreating Super Mario in AR, right? 
for me, also it was about just generating this interest and getting conversations started and having people not only talk about what is possible now, but what will possibly be possible five or six years from now. And, and that's what it kind of led to. It led to a lot of interesting conversations when people seeing, is this the future of gaming? Is, can AR now be used outdoors? Because that's something that has not been tried before. Can AR be used for fitness uh, activities? Will these headset, five or ten, will, will these large expansive outdoor experiences become the norm? And many people are now questioning, do, now, do I now have to deal with weird guys jumping around the place uh, and not looking down at their phone? Uh, they already got a taste of that with Pokemon Go, but except now you'll be with something probably mounted on your head. Um, and another thing that I always get asked a lot is what is my opinion on AR versus uh, VR. Um, I have worked with VR and I have worked uh, with AR. Personally, my opinion is that AR has a lot more immediate potential and AR is po possibly going to be a stepping stone maybe to VR. And one of the main reasons that I feel AR um, is going to have much mass adoptions, not only because a lot of companies are supporting it currently, but more importantly uh, is the user experience that it provides. VR demands full immersion, right? It asks to cut you out of what you're doing. You have to wear this headset. You're completely occluded from the world around you. Whereas AR just allows, overlays it onto the real world. So it, it de demands less effort from the user, which is why I feel it's a better stepping stone and a, a a better stepping stone rather than a uh, VR. And um, that's basically about it. So if you have any questions, I would love to kind of take them now. <laughs> yep. I've, I've got both those questions very often. Uh, so it took me about a month to build it, um, including uh, building out the, three, the 3D assets and all those things. It was not, it was a sleepless month, but let me put it that way. Um, and uh, in addition um, to that, if I'm going to build more games, I'm not too sure. Um, I, I was thinking I might do maybe like another level of Super Mario, one of the underground levels in the subway or something like that. Um, yeah. But at the same time, there's been also like a lot of interest um, of like recreating like Doom or one of the older uh, older classic games, but but I, I do have a feeling that there'll be a lot of uh, developers who will now start working on it themselves. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Um, did you attend the AR in action? AR in action. Do you have you heard of it? I have not. Oh, good. Please. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, cool. Back January, we had 800 people participate, and they came from all over the world, from Tokyo, doing things like you know dinosaurs coming out of trees, nice construction to it yeah, was like awesome. And they had it in June, just uh, June seventh. Uh, oh, AR in action. So get you know get on that. AR okay, action. I'll do that. I would probably love to yeah. see that. Also, there, if you can't make well, this one passed. Having one again on January 16th and 17th at the MIT Media Lab. I'll oh, great! I'll. You. Yeah. That's awesome because I've only used them indoors. Yeah. That is a great thing in terms of bringing it uh, to life. Another thing, um, besides the Hololens, my friend who also started AR Action Group, they have a, the thing called the Meta. Have yeah. You heard of the, okay. I have. have you had a yes. I haven't had a chance to play with it. I don't have access to one yet. Okay. Yeah. Just curious. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So in terms of making the objects more real, were you able to, and does the Hololens support this at all? Get a sense of where the light is coming from, and uh, you talked a bit about like the strength of the light, yeah. either to give like a shadow of the object, or also to give like a little like glare right on the surface of the object, like you know the sun is shining on. Um, it so it doesn't know where environmental light is coming from, but you can uh, uh, put programmatic lights which simulate the environment to give you those kind of reflections and glares. Okay. Yeah. It's a completely self-contained. So the HoloLens has the power source inbuilt into it. Um, I have used it extensively, and it lasts about maybe two, two and a half hours, um, which is not that bad. Yeah. Yeah. Have you started playing with AR? 
AR kit. AR kit yet? Uh, I haven't started playing with AR kit yet because I don't have access to an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. Once I get an iPhone, or if someone gives me an iPhone, <laughs> hint, 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> then I will start playing with the AR kit. Yeah. You mentioned multiplayer. So yes. Um, well, multiplayer, essentially, I would have to dress up as Luigi and play the game again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. How, how mature would you say the tool, software tools are right now? Did you have to coerce them to do things they're not really ready for? Or um, I, I think Unity uh, 3D, like the Unity engine is amazing. Um, and you can do like a lot with it. But at the same time, Perhaps the HoloLens documentation is not the best yet. Um, it's not put together yet, though they do have an, a forum which is relatively active, and they're quite helpful over there. So it did require me to go to the forum several times and dig around in different places to get everything to work. But Unity itself is quite a mature uh, platform. Yes? You mentioned computational intensiveness in your programming. How like, intensive was the runtime of your final product? Okay. Oh, I forgot completely. I should have been repeating these questions. So, um, so he asked, what is the computational intensiveness of running these programs? Um, this was not uh, computationally too in, um, intensive. The HoloLens says that it can render up to 100,000 uh, polygons without any problem. Um, and especially in the case of Mario, because it has this pixelated kind of boxy look, uh, so the assets themselves were not very he heavy. Yeah. So this ran without any problem. Okay, did Nintendo reach out to me after this is out? No, they haven't reached out to me yet. A uh, lot of people have said that they will, only with a cease and desist. So, um, <laughs> um, but that hasn't happened yet. I, I, I don't know if I'm happy or I'm kind of bummed out, but. <laughs> yes? Yeah, uh, so the question is, uh, Unity has an option to suspend the laws of physics. Uh, so I did play with that. Uh, the, the thing with AR as compared to VR is that AR still has the real world anchored around you. So it doesn't create the illusion. Um, it doesn't create a good enough illusion uh, to play with gravity. Because there were some suggestions that for me to climb up the pipes, maybe I could lower the entire level as I was jumping. But because I would, my, I would also be seeing the real world anchored where it is, it would not be a good effect at all. Yeah. Yeah. So we read from the bio you had uh, being asked your entrepreneur founded in multiple startups. Are they VR AR related? What are you okay. From my bio, what have been my past businesses? Uh, so, so one of them, yes, was related to VR and AR. Um, it's called Sur Surround. Um, and essentially, it is a platform to create and share uh, live 360 augmented videos. So you can take um, 360 video. 360 video is video that you can look around in all directions. And it is captured with specific 3D cameras. Uh, and we allow companies and brands to live stream. Uh, a 360 distributed through a platform, but at the same time augment it with elements. So you can layer it with any kind of uh, 3D objects, 3D elements, any kind of rich media, images, text, tweets, um, uh, websites, uh, and uh, send it out to your consumers. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So just building off of that, not everyone can you know get to Central Park to play your game. Yes. Like, would it be possible to use like 360 video to just film Central Park really well, and then you know put it in in a VR situation where you have the the element add-ons from your code, mm -hmm. and you have the 360 video, and then anyone around the world, so long as they have the hundred meters of straight flat space, yeah. can now see Central Park and can see the objects that you've put into it and play the game as if they were in Central Park. Okay. So the uh, the the question is. Uh, how do you transport someone in who cannot uh, go to Central Park into a VR thing? Is there some technique to maybe recreate Central Park in VR and then integrate this game into it? Um, so the problem with ca capturing a 360 video is that the 360 video does not have any depth. So essentially, it is just a sphere. And you place the camera in the center of the sphere and, and look around in all directions. So you would not be able to create the 110 meter depth. Uh, what you could do um, is 
maybe do a really large uh, photogrammetry capture of, uh, of uh, Central Park. So photogrammetry is taking pictures of an object from multiple directions. Um, and then it uses that to kind of map and create um, an actual actual 3D representation of that uh, thing. So either a huge photogrammetry uh, capture or using something like a LiDAR sensor um, uh, to recreate the entire space, import that into a VR space, and then integrate your Mario uh, game into it. Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> yes? Okay, so um, applications of AR beyond video games and possibly in educational space. Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, for education, and that's where Microsoft also has been using the Hololens a lot is educational spaces because it, and shared experiences. I feel like in educational uh, experiences, being able to like share an educational experience itself is really powerful. So using them in classrooms, um, using them to kind of. Uh, they're examples of uh, interaction with like, the solar system, right? And you can't really interact with the solar system, but you can take like a 3D representation of the solar system, place it on the table, have your students kind of uh, stand around it, look into it, and then actually see how everything works. Or the, similarly, there are a lot, of, um, a lot of use cases in human anatomy. And human anatomy and understanding the body is something which is really cool because you can actually take the body, split it up into all its different subsections, walk around, interact with it, and see all the different elements. So, so definitely, education, like the possibilities are endless in education. Right. OK, looks like that is it. <laughs>